In recent years, electric vehicles have gone from novelties to some of the most desirable vehicles on the road. And by 2030, some states will only allow new vehicles to be sold if they're electric vehicles. But how will we develop the infrastructure needed for the day when we're all charging up instead of gassing up? Jeff Doyle has spent the past 25 years advising legislators and policymakers on how to adapt to innovation in the transportation sector, and I want to ask him about the opportunities and challenges to achieving electrification of transportation infrastructure. Jeff, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me, Andrew. So I guess my first question is, why now? Why is electrification finally coming to the forefront in transportation and public policy discussions? It's the climate imperative, and I think there's no credible people that would deny that um, gr with greenhouse gas emission levels being what they are, that we're really at a tipping point. And uh, when you think about how we reduce at least the human-caused GHG, uh, transportation is uh, the largest single emitter. So it's uh, we're emitting more GHG uh, than the electric power sector, uh, more GHG than agriculture, industry, um, uh, commercial, residential. So uh, policymakers, not just in the United States, but around the world are looking at transportation, electrification as one way uh, to reduce uh, those emissions. When people think of electric cars, they probably think about Tesla. How has Tesla's success affected the development of electrification infrastructure and the way that policymakers think about it? Yeah, of course, Tesla is a great example of, you know, they, they took a different tack than some of the automakers. And one of the things that they did, um, in addition to their innovations within the actual automobile itself, uh, was that they um, owned essentially their charging network, at least the public access charging network. So they were making sure that their customers uh, as part of buying a Tesla in that brand, um, that they had access to public charging stations in places that were uh, convenient and also necessary. So for example, uh, you may have heard of the Tesla supercharger network. Um, it's a series, uh, well, a network of stations um, that now are all throughout the United States on major highways. Uh, it wasn't the first uh, electric vehicle charging network, long distance charging network. Uh, that was actually on the West Coast with the West Coast Electric Highway, but Tesla has undoubtedly been the most successful. So they have um, ensured that if you buy a Tesla, that you can char, you can go anywhere uh, that you want or need to go, and you'll have access to charging at their locations. Uh, there is a, a bit of a downside, though, that I think we should mention. Uh, the Tesla model is proprietary, so they're not truly interoperable public access stations, at least not right now, um, unless you have adapters and special permissions and that type of thing. Um, so um, while it's been successful for Tesla, I'm not sure that that's something that um, would be in the best interest of mass consumer adoption is if every automobile maker had their own EV charging network. Um, the opposite of that, or at least the yeah the alternative to that, um, is public access charging that's interoperable, so that anybody that has an electric vehicle um, can pull up anywhere and be able to charge. Now you might have to pay, uh, of course, for the electricity or the access to the electricity, but at least you won't be locked out from a technology standpoint. When I drive around my town, you know, I see gas stations everywhere today. What's that going to look like by 2030? Do you think? Well, I think by 2030, you're going to see a very robust public access charging network. Um, ideally, and, and I think this is possible, particularly with uh, the passage of the new infrastructure uh, bill in, in Congress, uh, there's going to be a lot more level two, that is medium speed charging, where people it's destination charging. So if you're going to the mall or you're going to a movie theater or even you know parks or um, natural areas, uh, there will be opportunities to top off your battery there. But I think um, perhaps most importantly, what you're going to see by 2030 is much more interoperability, uh, not only um, you know with your vehicle make and model being able to use any charging station, but the actual plugs themselves right now, or at least up until now, 
Um, there's been dueling standards, and that's uh, always difficult when you're trying to have consumers adopt a new technology if they don't know what types of standards that they're um, trying to purchase into. And a car is not a small purchase. It, for a lot of people, it's the largest purchase they'll ever make. So I think that you'll see that. I, also, I think that by 2030, there's got to be more emphasis placed on placing uh, public chargers in areas where people who don't have access to their own charging, in other words, they they don't have a garage or a carport, some place that they can, you know, plug in at home. Uh, instead, they need to be able to rely on uh, shared uh, charging stations, either you know at multifamily residences, condominiums, and apartments, or even at the workplace if they're still um, commuting to work. Well, this is an absolutely fascinating topic. I hope we can talk about this more soon. But Jeff, thank you for being here with me today. Yes, thank you for having me. If you're interested in more conversations with innovative minds like Jeff, please like this video and click to subscribe to our channel. And if you wanna track more of the biggest challenges in transportation, you'll wanna to subscribe to our revenue policy newsletter with all the news and insights you'll need to stay ahead of the game in a rapidly evolving field. So click the link below to sign up for that newsletter as well as other newsletters from CDM Smith.